Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, there's something to be said for counter-programming, and if you're within the sound of my voice, I'm going to guess that means that you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals, and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And if you like how we do things around here, and I'm going to assume that you do, because you're listening to us right now, uh, you can subscribe to the podcast and give us one of those big five-star ratings. You can find us over at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, basically wherever you get your podcasts. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In The Seats YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we'd really appreciate it. Also, uh, don't uh, hesitate to go looking for us on social media. We're uh, on Facebook, we're on Twitter, and we're on Instagram, either at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, and I say this a lot, but it's true, it's the most important. Please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, basically the moving image at large, because if we love to write about it and talk about it, we love it when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So uh, pay us a visit. Stop on by. On this episode, we're dipping our toes into the uh, Sundance Film Festival, which just wrapped up its latest online version. And, you know, we we found something that was really quite charming and really, really quite interesting. And not sort of the fare that you'd expect out of a festival like Sundance, but it was an absolute charmer. And uh, we were really looking forward to tell the world about it. It's a film uh, from Vietnam. It's called Micah, the Girl from Another Galaxy. And it, it uh, follows the story of eight-year-old Hung, this young man who was, who was coping with the death of his mother and having difficulty really connecting with his father, who is now a single parent. Uh, when his best friend moves away and others in the apartment are moving away too because a greedy landlord uh, wants to push everybody out of town so he can sell the place. One one fateful night, Hung, you know, runs up to the roof so he can be alone and watch the night sky, and he witnesses a falling star hit the ground by a lake near his uh, near his building. He hops on his bike in search of adventure, in search of what this was. He arrives there, and instead of a meteor, he discovers an alien girl from the planet Micah, who who came in search of her friend. Hung helps Micah find her friend and get back home, but. She also helps Hung make new friends as well and mend his broken heart. But there's uh, sinister forces afoot as well, as as there's more people than Hung know that there uh, an alien has landed and is in town. And it's it's such it is such an absolute charmer. And it, I mean, it's uh, influenced by uh, believe it or not, a, a television show. Uh, and it's just one of those things that you get wrapped up in watching and you just kind of fall in love with and it's it really is just sort of a sweet piece of family cinema that translates for all ages you know be you know you can be nine or you can be 109 it's that kind of movie uh and we had the distinct pleasure of sitting down and talking with writer director ham tran and producer uh jenny trang lee to uh to talk about sort of the origins of the story and the making of the film and, and getting it out there into the universe again and uh, just sort of the, the trials and tribulations and the positives and negatives of working with kids and sort of adapting this story uh, to turn it into something that will will cross barriers and cross languages and really be a delight for, for all ages. And I, I hope people get to see it when it's finished its festival run and... Uh, uh, come, uh, comes to a either a theater or a video on demand platform near you. But uh, first, enjoy our talk with uh, Ham and Jenny because uh, I mean it's a good one, and we again we we have really big hopes for Micah, the girl from another galaxy, because it is just an absolute charmer. Fantastic! All right. Well, first off, thank you so much for the time today. I really appreciate it. Thank oh, you so thank much. you for having us, and we we really enjoy your voice. Oh, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> 
Nice voice. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I just whispered to. I was like, oh, he's got a big voice. <laughs> now, I mean, congratulations on the film. Like, It was adorable. I absolutely loved it. I guess my first question for you guys is walk me through sort of the origin of the story and like where, where this sort of where this all kind of started from. Well, you know, the, the, the film is actually inspired by an old Czechoslovakian TV show called The Girl Who Fell Out of the Blue Sky, which was made in 1974, right, in the Czech Republic. And, um, and somehow in the late 80s, early 90s, found its way to Vietnamese TV and spawned a whole generation of hardcore fans to the point where they were naming their kids Micah, and they were getting haircuts, the bowl cut, like the like the main char alien character in, in the TV show, and they call it the Micah cut, right? And so um, the uh, film studio executive, they, she's also a fan of Micah. So she had always wanted to sort of, you know, she was so, always wanted to have our own version in Vietnam. And so they were developing the project for like four years, and finally they're like, but, but we need somebody with sort of, like we, we can't have like a, a, a local um, sort of uh, sensibility to it. Mm. It needs to be a little bit more, you know, I'm, I'm what they call a Viet Q, which is like a Vietnamese from abroad, right? I was born in okay. Vietnam, but I grew up in the States. So they say, we need somebody with a, with a you know, a different um, aesthetics and, and a broader view. And so when they approached me, um, I, I was sort of trying to um, get over losing my mother. And so when they came to me with this story about this little boy who lost his mom and how, how he's trying to overcome his grief and he meets this alien girl, right? And she's lost and he, he tries to help her get back and she sort of restores his life and they become the best friends. I was like, that's, this is, this is my film. I have to do this, yeah. you know? And I have to do this for my mom. So um, being that as the inspiration, I, I put, my heart and, and soul into this so that it, I can make it as a love letter to my mom. Well, yeah. it, and it was shows. a special project, especially because, you know, um, him and I have known each other since like the late 90s. And we used to right. do theater together and you know, we went back to Vietnam around the same time. And so to come to come together to do this film has been especially special, you know, mm -hmm. and, and because we're like family. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that love definitely shows on the screen, man, because it, it's a beautiful thing. And I mean, I think the last thing I expected to hear was a Czech TV show turned into a Vietnamese film. So I, love that <laughs> I know, right? Story right? Itself. You should watch it because it's oh, it's a trip. <laughs> it's like, you know, but what's great about it is like as I was writing, I was I was finding so many things that could be related, right? So in the in the Czech TV show, they were flying across these castles, and Da Nang, the city where we had chose to to set the the, the film. Up in the mountains, there's this resort called Bana Hills, and there are these castle-like structures up there, mm -hmm. right? And then so, and then this film is it's sort of like it's a sci-fi movie, it's about space. And and then I come to discover the first Asian to be in space is actually Vietnamese, right? Wow. Yeah. And so um, and his name is you know Phan Tung, and he's yeah. like, he was he was a cosmonaut and he flew up with the Russians, right? And so and, and all these. Cool little and he's still and he's still alive. Actually, and he's still alive. Yeah. We we wanted to keep we wanted to get him for an after credit sequence, but he was like, you know, it was COVID. Like, it was COVID. It was so COVID, it was and so hard. he was really he was very nervous was, about yeah, coming out. Which, yeah, we didn't want to push him. But yeah, it's amazing. So no, I mean, obviously, on a film like this, casting is so important, and I mean, these kids are just electric, and I mean, they have great chemistry. Can you talk you know, a little bit just about? I can imagine it was a lengthy process to find the right kids for the right parts. It was, but we we got really lucky. Um, it was because I found the main kid from directing a commercial, and he had a little bit part. But I sort of observed uh, how he was so comfortable, f like finding things for himself to do when he's not shooting. And then when he was on screen, all I had to do was explain the situation to him, and he found his own motivation for everything. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then with the with Micah and and um, Tintin. Right. The other character who I think stole the show. Definitely now, stole the show. We, we found him through our casting director, who's yeah. a very dear friend of ours that we've known for like 25 years as well. Yeah. And so Micah, um, Micah is actually before this, she was just like a, a you know, baby model. So she had, this is her first acting role. Wow. And, you know, when we saw when we saw her tape and her eyes were like half the, the size of her face, we realized that this is the girl. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but but Tintin, the, the, the kid that plays Gubeo, you know, he he's been singing and dancing and rapping and singing opera 
for since he was four years old. Wow. And that kid is like a stage dynamo. So oh my God. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> he's great. Every time we call cut, he would just look into the camera and start rapping. Right. And I wish we had that footage, you know. But he will always wait until we go cut and then he starts rapping. I'm like, oh no. But basically the whole movie him was like a little less, a little less. Yeah. You know, he would project everything. <laughs> and so when he was acting with uh, home, the other boy, uh, he would be like, what? You know, and, he, and the, other, you know, like the, other, the other actor would be like, whoa, <laughs> because he was projecting so loud into their faces, you know. Um, but so, we, we did find the secret to keeping the kids happy. And every time we needed them to do multiple takes and, you know, things like that, which are not so fun for kids, is that they love boba tea, you know, milk tea. Right. And if we promise them a boba. They bubble tea. Bubble, bubble tea, tea. That's, that's the key. That's the key for, for anybody who's looking to make some children's movies. Bubble, bubble tea. Bubble tea. <laughs> I never thought I'd see that as a line item on a on a production budget for a film, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, something else that really caught me off guard with the film is not just sort of the obvious, almost sort of '80s Hollywood throwback charm. A lot of some of, some of the kids' movies, but I mean, there were some social issues in there as well, just dealing with sort of the gentrification in the neighborhood and that kind of thing. How did you guys manage to strike the balance between fun but also trying to say something at the same time? Well, yeah, I mean, because I think that I think that people don't give kids enough credit, you know, when they're watching a film that I think that they actually can understand a lot more. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, but but as long as we, we keep the film fun for them. Right. And so it's really accessible in that sense. But at the same time, I wanted to have a very strong message about family. Right. And so right. the whole gentrification process is the same thing. It's sort of like families being moved out of their homes so that, you know, huge developers can come in and make you know shiny new buildings and so it's all about sort of what happens when the family gets moved or what happens how does that impact on the family and the ultimate message is really about you know being there for your kids right mm -hmm. um and it, it, because of course the the theme is is you know home has lost his mother it's about it's about losing a loved one but at the same time you know we have to appreciate the people who are with us right and have to be there for them so at the end of the day it's just about being there and i think that's one of the lines that you know for me i really liked was uh, when the mother is on her deathbed and, and the father's like i can't raise him by myself and he goes yes you can you just have to be there for him and it, it's as simple as that kids they just need you there right mm -hmm. yeah. and they just need to be reminded that they are loved you know, and I think that that message uh, kids they can all relate to. And then you give them the slime and you get them the powder and you get them the, right. the foam, right. the parts and, <laughs> you know, and then you keep them laughing and entertained. And and I think the message will, will, will go come through. No, you're absolutely right. And I think it does that. And then some I mean, this is definitely a film for sort of all audiences. And I mean, as a sci fi geek myself, Something else about the film, which really I love, is just sort of, I guess, the, I don't want to say use of special effects, but definitely sort of how they were carefully placed throughout. It wasn't a question of you were trying to overdo it with, you know, when she would, you know, fight someone and the effects would come up or she'd be, you know, showing off her powers. How important, like, can you talk a little bit just about sort of the design of that and just making sure that it was kind of sparse throughout as opposed to being overloaded with it? Well, we, we knew we didn't have the budget, basically. Yeah. <laughs> it was a budgetary constraint. Right? <laughs> like, and we were trying to do as many things practically as possible. You like sometimes we, she's floating. We're literally just carrying her. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. That was like if you just see the feet, we actually carried. <laughs> so we we're trying to do that as, as as much as possible, but because we knew, like, we did a, we didn't want to make a film that was about special effects, right? right? And so keeping it sparks means means let letting the audience focus more on the human story and the connection between the kids. It's really about the friendship, right? Uh, between Home and Micah. And so we actually had a lot more things that were planned, like, you know, they're going to pick berries and she's using her tentacles to pull down the trees and things like that. But at the end of the day, that wasn't part of their story, right? Yeah. It's not part of what their bond was about. It's not about her being an alien. It's about, you know, two friends helping each other, you know, with, with what's, you know, with the problems in their lives and so keeping uh re you know the, the special effects to a minimum actually helped towards focusing um the theme of the film i mean even towards the end when she starts to lose so, so much of her power and then she starts to turn back into the alien we mm. decided to do with makeup you know it, it, right. it was 
And that it was, was really fun. Yeah. And it was, it was really annoying for her because it took hours. Yeah. But then and I was just thinking, man, if we had done that from the beginning, like I can't, I think the kids would be just not into it, you know, because mm-hmm. it would just take too long and, and for them to have, or if they had to imagine if they just wore like a green, a green, sc- a green a suit. suit and, right. you know, it just, it, it would, would lose kind of that natural reaction of each other. You know, yeah. so and so for so for kids, I mean, they did great in the film because they're they're smart, they're you know imaginative. But whatever we you can help to make it as real as possible, of course, it makes it for a more authentic kind of uh, performance. Uh, for you, I mean, for both of you, but I mean, Ham specifically, because I mean, you obviously don't necessarily have a track record of doing you know films targeted towards kids. This is definitely tonally a bit of a shift. But at the end <laughs> of the day, does it always come down to story depending on what you're looking for? Absolutely, it all comes down to story. But I think that. The, the similarity, though, there, all of my films, if you think about it, all of my films are about family, yeah. you know, at the end of the day. And it's about the core value of family and being reminded to stay in touch with your kids. Because I think that and that's that's the thing that a lot of people take for granted, that they sort of talk down to their kids. Mm-hmm. But I think that if you kind of understand it on their level and you're able to talk to them on their level, I think that they're able to get a lot more and, and they, they can be empowered to do a lot more. Now, is there anything you learned uh, while shooting about shooting with a kid cast that maybe you didn't expect to learn? Uh, when kids don't want to work, they just don't want to work. And so <laughs> you just have to like allow them, you have to allow them the chance to play. And that's yeah. the key is that, you know, making the film fun and making the scene fun and, and then uh, giving them a chance to just play with the scene, right? Yeah. Even when it, when it gets to a serious point, because as long as they know, they'll get there. Right. right. It's just having the faith that they'll get there on their own. Yeah. And for me, I think um, working with kids specifically is that you have to cast the parents. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually not just the kids you're working with, but the parents. And um, especially in Vietnam, you know, parents like they're they're very very present <laughs> and and it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's like a whole nother kind of management of um exp- managing expectations of like being very you know transparent with them of make just. Um, and, and understanding each parent and each kid's little nuances, you know, and sort of like sure. the, the story behind that, you know, for, for me, I, I was just trying to keep them, you know, happy and fed and ready to go so that this guy can work his magic, you know? <laughs> Boba. 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 Bubble <laughs> tea. Bubble tea. That's all I have to There's say. There's going to be a line item on every, every, every film budget. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Boba yeah. tests and bubble tea. Yeah. <laughs> Play dates. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, just to start putting a bow on this, I mean, this is a silly question, but it's one I always like to ask. Can you guys think back to sort of the younger days and like, tell me about sort of the movies or moments from movies that, that kind of got you into this business to start? Wow. Well, that's, that's a great question. That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, my very first exposure to American films was Live and Let Die. Oh, wow. Okay. Right. And so it is a sort of... Uh, I remember because, you know, we used to go to Vung Tao. It's like a, a beach resort town. And um, in the hotel, they would actually have a room at that time. They would have a room that's set aside for foreigners, right? And so they would right. screen foreign films. But I was the local kid who kept sneaking into the room and try to sneak in and watch the movies. And I remember being so scared by the guy with the claw. You remember right, living that right, guy yeah. with the claw? And I was like, ah, right? And so that's always been like my biggest impression is, is um 007 so my whole dream was like wow that's amazing you know you know i wow if one day i could actually make a 007 that would be cool <laughs> that would be cool yeah yeah <laughs> i mean i i always i always grew up with tv as like my babysitter sure, you know like sure. my parents both worked and they were like i was a latch kid and i just remember watching so many tv shows and and but realizing that they weren't like my family you know like i, I would watch full house but then <laughs> my family was not like full house at all <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then and then it wasn't when I got older and I started doing community theater and started learning more about like you know Vietnamese American theater or Asian American theater and really understanding that that those kinds of stories, you know, and right. and but the but the but I always wanted to do a children like a family movie. I always wanted to do like a really like uplifting, lighthearted, but also emotional. Like I feel like not that Forrest Gump is the same, but Forrest Gump for me was one of those films that like it kind of had a little bit of real reality what really happened it was obviously fiction but it was just so fun to watch and mm. you, you love the character so much and and I just think does any character driven sort of films really do it for me and as a producer I've done all genres you know and so I just really work 
um, I'm just really fortunate to work with my friends, like this guy over here, <laughs> you know? And, and for me, what the kind of films that I want to make is like a film where, of course, it's a great film at the end, but really the journey of the filmmaking is, is something to Very be important. memorable and, and to be like special. Not just the product, but the process as well. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Absolutely. And I mean, I love both your answers because I, I see a little bit of both of them in this film. And I mean, I think you guys have done great work and I can't wait for more audiences to get to see it. But uh, thank you both for the time today and congratulations again on the film. And uh, this was fun. I really, thanks again for the time. Thank you, David. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.